It's about time there was a Blood Wave build, and this one is not only a lot of fun to play, but it can also tackle shockingly high level Nightmare Dungeons. At level 85, I'm pushing level 70 Nightmares, and anything in the mid to high 50s is comfortable and relatively fast. This build was also just buffed in the latest patch, and while the gameplay footage will be from before that, the build itself is now stronger than ever. I'll run you through how it works, then I'll show you how to build it, and then how it's played and all the different interactions. It works by rapidly resetting your cooldowns for endless blood waves. You both reset your cooldowns and inflict extremely high shadow dot damage by applying multiple AoE dots. You stay alive and healthy with massive blood orb generation by keeping enemies at bay through AoE stunts and being able to spam the knockback from your blood wave, all while keeping enemies permanently trapped in bone prisons. We also make use of a nifty bone prison interaction for absurd corpse generation. If you like the idea of controlling the battlefield, comboing your abilities, stacking up massive dots, and launching endless blood waves, then this is the build for you. Starting with our talents, we don't actually use a basic skill, but still need to use two points to progress, so put them anywhere. In our core skills, we put one point into Blight and take Supernatural Blight for the extra damage modifier. This is another ability that we don't actually have on our bar, and I'll cover why in the aspect section. Max out Hued Flesh, this is essential to fueling our corpse generation. Take Blood Mist up to Ghastly Blood Mist, this helps us generate extra corpses in a pinch. Max out Corpse Explosion, and take the Blighted upgrade to turn it into a Shadow Dot. Fortunately, in the latest patch, it no longer blinds us, so you don't have to deal with what you can see on screen. In this build, we don't actually need to spend or generate essence, so we can skip out on Grim Harvest. We max out Bone Prison to reduce its cooldown and increase its life, and we also take the Ghastly upgrade so we can permanently apply Vulnerable. A quick detour, but it's worth explaining why this is so important. Despite Bone Prison doing no damage, we are able to rapidly generate corpses through our Hued Flesh talent. It appears that the Ghastly upgrade essentially causes your prison to rapidly pulse and apply the vulnerable status to anyone inside. Even though applying vulnerable doesn't do any damage itself, for whatever reason it still procs huge flesh. Using this, we can instantly generate many corpses at the start of a fight to fuel our corpse tendrils and corpse explosion damage. We don't need to rely on something like Reap to create that first corpse. Plus, we get the added benefits of applying Vulnerable and severely disrupting the enemies so we can pump out damage in peace. Next, we take Decrepify and the Abhorrent Upgrade. This is key to enabling our massive cooldown reduction. Max Amplify Damage, Max Death's Embrace. Even though we aren't spending much time in close range, the damage reduction is still valuable. We take 2 of 3 in Death's Reach for some extra damage. We only need 1 in Corpse Tendrils, and we take the Blood Orb Upgrade. We don't need our tendrils to apply vulnerable, as our bone prison has that covered, and with our rapid cooldown reduction, we can create so many extra blood orbs to keep us healthy and to keep our fortify maxed out. Max out Reaper's Pursuit for the movement speed, and max out both Gloom and Terror for the extra damage. We don't need any more stuns, so skip Crippling Darkness. Next up, we take Blood Wave, up to the Blood Orb upgrade. With an Aspect and our cooldown reduction, this will also create a lot of Blood Orbs to sustain us. Max out Standalone for the incredible damage reduction, and max out Memento Mori to boost our sacrifice bonuses. And finally, we take Shadow Blight. The damage is nice, but really, this is for enabling another Aspect that we'll get to in a moment. In our Book of the Dead, we sacrifice our Reapers for more Shadow Damage. This build does a lot of damage, so if survivability happens to be a problem for you, swapping this to the Defender's Sacrifice can be a good alternative. Sacrifice the Cold Mages for the added vulnerable damage, and sacrifice the Bone Golem for the extra attack speed. Once again, if survivability becomes an issue, you can swap this out for the Blood Golem Sacrifice to gain some extra life instead. So, on our bar, in whatever position is most comfortable for you, we want Blood Wave, Blood Mist, Corpse Tendrils, Decrepify, Bone Prison, and Corpse Explosion. Okay, with our talents sorted, what aspects do we need to enable this build? The Blighted Aspect provides an absurdly high damage boost of 240% when applied to a two-hand weapon, or 180% if applied to the neck for a one-hand version that I'll cover in a moment. We have near-permanent uptime on this huge buff through our multiple AoE dots. Next is the Aspect of Ultimate Shadow. 
This makes our Blood Wave also do shadow damage and apply a strong shadow damage over time. To add on to that, we run the Tidal Aspect which fires off another two waves with each cast, resulting in multiple high damage dots, knockbacks and blood orbs. Then we have the Aspect of Plunging Darkness, so our Bone Prison also creates a pool of blight. This is yet another dot that helps activate our Blighted Aspect, inflict more damage and create corpses through hued flesh. It also applies that 15% damage bonus from Supernatural Blight. If you are playing with a one-hander and a focus, you would then put the freshly buffed Fast Blood Aspect on your focus for a huge boost to your Blood Wave cooldown reduction. It's worth noting that a focus innately provides extra cooldown reduction too. If I had another Blighted Aspect, I would prefer to play the build with a one-hander instead of a two-hander. If you don't have the Howl from Below Gloves, you could place Fast Blood here instead and still run a two-hander. I'll cover this unique in more detail in a moment. Aspect of the Embalmer is a great source of more blood orbs, as we are casting a lot of corpse explosions. Defensively, the Aspect of Disobedience is an excellent choice, and the Aspect of Exploding Mist is great for inflicting even more damage while being invulnerable. It's particularly useful to get the ball rolling and apply your dots against very dangerous packs. Now, my gear is far from perfect, but ideally in our helm we would have life, cooldown reduction, armor, and intelligence or all stats. Chests should have life and other damage reductions. The Howl from Below Gloves are a great fit for this build. They come with a high lucky hit roll, the corpse skill attack speed is great for stacking our dots, and the extra corpse explosion damage, and homing skeletons is handy for damaging enemies anywhere in the room. If you don't have this unique, try to find gloves with lucky hit chance, shadow dot damage, attack speed, and all stats or intelligence. If you run a one-hander with a focus and normal gloves, you have room for one more aspect, which I would use on the blood-soaked aspect or the aspect of decay. For pants, we want life, ranks of corpse explosion, damage reductions, and if you can afford losing a defensive roll, ranks of bone prison are decent too. For boots, I'm of the opinion that Grease of the Empty Tomb is our best choice. Even though we don't use the aspect on it, the extra lucky hit is highly valuable and you can't roll that stat on normal boots. We also get another defensive stat that can't normally be rolled. If you don't have them, look for boots with movement speed, ranks of corpse tendrils, intelligence, all stats or dodge. For our weapon, we want a wand for the lucky hit chance or a two hand scythe for the healing with vulnerable damage, damage to slowed enemies, damage to enemies with a shadow dot and ultimate skill damage. I don't have a Black River to test it yet, but I suspect it would be worth using with this build. We want an amulet with cooldown reduction, shadow damage over time, darkness skill damage, and damage reduction from enemies in a shadow dot. There are other useful roles to passives like Fueled by Death that we'd also be happy with. On our rings, we want life, lucky hit chance, vulnerable damage, and damage to slowed enemies. On a focus, we want cooldown reduction, lucky hit chance, damage reduction from enemies in a shadow dot, and any other defensive roles. For our weapon gems, shadow dot damage is the safest bet as it works for the majority of our damage. Diamonds for ultimate damage are the fun alternative, but likely a slight dip in overall performance. In our armor, we want topaz for the huge damage reduction. This triggers even if it's just a slow being applied to you, so it has great uptime and a strong effect. In our jewelry slot, we slot in skulls for the extra armor. For our consumables, lucky hit chance, armor, life, attack speed, and relevant damage increases for the mob type are good options. Our Paragon board is a very lean build. By only taking the most valuable nodes and paths, we amass 5 glyph slots and 4 valuable legendary nodes. I'll run you through the important goals. First, socketing the Blood Drinker Glyph. This is what gives us near endless fortify when paired with our massive blood orb generation. The first board we activate is actually the Flesh Eater. We can path up to the legendary node, then socket the control glyph for a huge damage boost to crowd controlled enemies. Slows count as crowd control, so anyone that's decrepified or hit with corpse tendrils counts, which with this build is all the time. The next board we attach is Wither. We can path down to the legendary node, then fork out to the glyph. Here we attach Scourge, which provides a sizable increase to our shadow dot damage. Next, we attach the Scent of Death board and path to the Glyph Socket, where we put in our Exploit Glyph. Unfortunately, there isn't much dexterity to be had on our boards, but regardless, as Vulnerable is in its own damage bucket, it's useful to Socket at this point. 
We can then path to the legendary node and then back along our closest path to a gate where we attach the final Blood Begets Blood board. I'm not high enough level to fill out this board yet, but I'll show you the plan for a complete level 100 Paragon board. We path to the Glyph Socket where we attach our final Darkness Glyph to increase our shadow damage and reduce enemy damage. Finally, we path up to the legendary node, taking a quick detour to pick up some damage nodes. Even though overpower does nothing, the 10% damage is nice to have when it's so close. At this point, we've achieved every goal and have 9 points to spare that can then be placed to shore up any gaps in your build, defensively or offensively. A good place to start is in the first board as these magic nodes are boosted by the glyph. With the build all sorted out, how do you actually play it? The golden rule is to have Decrepify applied to every enemy. This slows them, reduces their damage, activates a huge number of our damage bonuses, and importantly, allows us to rapidly reset our cooldowns with lucky hits. Cast Blood Wave toward the most enemies, preferably in the direction you're about to explore. This ability travels beyond your screen and can devastate another screen's worth of packs if placed well. Then use Bone Prison in a central area or on key enemies like Elites. With the Corpse Generation interaction with the Vulnerable Talent and the Pool of Blight, you can immediately use Corpse Tendrils to pull surrounding enemies into the prison. Outside of using these cooldowns, spam your Corpse Explosions to stack up your dot damage and remember to apply Decrepify to any new enemies and reapply it if the fight has been going on for a while. It's important to remember that we're generating a huge number of blood orbs, so if you need healing, a Fortify top up or cooldown reduction with the Fast Blood aspect, Try to collect these in between casts. You can also Blood Mist through the fight to collect orbs in bulk. Just know that when you collect orbs this way, they don't give you Fortify for some reason. If the pack is large, including elites or has multiple waves, pay attention to your rapidly refreshing Blood Wave cooldown and be ready to fire it off again. What if you're fighting a small pack? Typically, a Decrepify into Bone Prison, Tendrils, then exploding one or two corpses will be enough to take them out and you can be on your merry way while the dots finish them. If enemy damage isn't too high, you can run through a dungeon tagging packs with your Decrepify to group them up for efficient AoE and clear speed. If possible, hallways and doorways are your friend. Blood Wave doesn't care about walls and will go right through, and these choke points work wonders for grouping enemies into your AoE abilities. To help optimize your damage, after a fight, it can be a good idea to stack your Flesh Eater to 4, so the next Corpse Explosion will trigger the 40% extra damage from the Legendary Paragon node. So long as the screen is in an advantageous position, where enemies are positioned at the corners, you can take out rooms from a ridiculously far distance, all while the enemy is stuck in or around your prison and unable to get to you. With all of this cooldown reduction, we can have almost permanent uptime on our Blood Mist. While this isn't intended to be an Infinimist build, against dangerous enemies it's still a good idea to remember that you have this option. The damage isn't as high, but it can get the ball rolling while keeping you safe. I've been unlucky in the sense that I don't have another blighted aspect to use on a one-hander. Despite not having that extra lucky hit chance from a wand, or having a freshly buffed Fast Blood aspect imprinted, my blood waves are already endless against larger packs. With a wand and fast blood, the blood waves will be utterly absurd and I can't wait to see that in action. And there we have it, this build is super fun, it utilizes a completely ignored ability in blood wave, and features a unique playstyle that lets you control the battlefield. Bosses, elites, and screens of enemies are all equally easy to take down. I really hope you enjoyed this guide and get to try out this build. Please let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more content like this, and I'll catch you in the next one.